Hello students, this is the second in your series of muscle lectures. This one is on the excitation at the neuromuscular junction. So in your first muscles lecture, you learned all of the parts, the anatomical, um, microscopic anatomical parts found inside of a muscle fiber. You learned the functions of those. And now we are going to I'm going to walk you through the processes of that getting that muscle to contract. And remember, we're using a skeletal muscle as our model here. All right, so talking skeletal muscles. In order for a muscle to contract, three things must happen. <clears throat> and... It has to be stimulated by a, neuro, by a nerve, okay? It has to, that nerve must propagate an action potential. <clears throat> that muscle fiber must have a rise in intracellular calcium. So those three things. Now the nervous system controls skeletal muscles. In order to get a skeletal muscle to contract, it has to be stimulated by a nerve. Um, um, a somatic motor neuron. Now, another thing you might hear is called a motor unit. So, what is a motor unit? A motor unit is a motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers it supplies. So, if you take a look at this top picture over here, this is showing a motor unit. So, I said it's a motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it supplies. Now, normally when we think of a neuron, a lot of times we think of it stimulating one, one cell only. But it doesn't have to stimulate one cell only. If we look at the terminals right over here, each terminal, okay, each terminal is going to stimulate one muscle fiber. And so that's how it is. One terminal will stimulate one muscle fiber. You really only have to have one terminal per one muscle fiber. So one motor neuron can stimulate multiple muscle fibers. All right, now, now I want to kind of take you, if you're looking at the top picture, where I'm circling, I'm going to blow that area up, and this is what we're going to see. This is what we're going to see. We're going to see what's called the neuromuscular junction. Now, the cells come exceedingly close to each other, but they do not touch each other. There's actually a space between them. This area, we call that the neuromuscular junction. <clears throat> so the neuromuscular junction has three parts. It has an axonal ending, okay, we see that as yellow down here. It has a synaptic cleft, that's the sly opening between them. It's called the synaptic cleft. Okay, it's right in here. That's the synaptic cleft. And then the sarcolemma, right? That's the motor, the motor end plate of the sarcolemma. That's the other part right there. Remember the sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber. So now I want to go into the excitation of a muscle fiber. We know that it has to be stimulated by a motor neuron, but we're going to get into more detail about how that happens. So we call this the process of excitation of a muscle fiber. <clears throat> so number one, what, is ha what happens? Well, we know that it's a neuron, somatic motor neuron. And that somatic motor neuron is experiencing an action potential. Okay, that's a nerve impulse. So you can imagine that nerve impulse traveling along the axon, down the axon terminals, and that's where we're picking up on this process. So number one, nerve impulse reaches the end of the axon terminal. So my little picture here, here's the axon terminal, and my little X's are representing that action potential spreading along the plasma membrane. 
<clears throat> so it's spreading along. Here it comes, here it comes, and to number two. Voltage regulated calcium channels open up. So they're voltage regulated. That means that a change in the charge is going to activate them. So here comes the change in the charge. Here comes the action potential, that depolarization event, and boom, it activates the calcium channels. The calcium channels open up and allow for an influx of calcium. So calcium rushes in, calcium ions rush in to the axon terminal. You can see that by my little arrows, and now we have a bunch of calcium on the inside. Okay, taking you back over here, we have calcium on the inside. Number three, calcium inside the axon causes axonal vesicles to fuse with the axonal membrane. Well, what do we, what also we have here are some vesicles. That's what we see in these circles. And there it happens to be a neurotransmitter in there. The neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. So there are vesicles of acetylcholine in the axonal ending. The calcium stimulates the vesicles of acetylcholine to undergo exocytosis. So following my little arrows, the vesicle migrates to the plasma membrane, okay? It opens up to the exterior and out comes the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, which is number four. Release of the acetylcholine within the synaptic cleft. Alright, so on to number five. We now have acetylcholine in that synaptic cleft. What happens next? Acetylcholine will now fit into the receptors. There are receptors along this motor end plate of the sarcolemma. I represented it with the blue, okay? And the acetylcholine will fit into those receptors. Okay, they fit right into those receptors on the sarcolemma. That particular action of the, of the neurotransmitter fitting into the receptor on the motor end plate of the sarcolemma, that is what initiates an action potential on the sarcolemma. Okay, so it initiates an action potential in the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber. See my little red X's? So that's to represent that depolarization that action potential that starts to spread along the sarcolemma in both, in, in both directions. It starts to spread along the sarcolemma and all around that muscle fiber. So now that action potential that was once here in the neuron is now here in the muscle fiber. And that has happened by way of the acetylcholine neurotransmitter working in that synaptic cleft. Because remember, these cell, the neuron has to tell the muscle fiber what to do. And it needs to tell it to have an action potential. But they don't actually touch. So it sends out this neurotransmitter to make it happen. Now, as long as there is acetylcholine <clears throat> within the synaptic cleft, this muscle fiber will continue to depolarize, okay? So we're gonna have one depolarization after our next. As it turns out, a depolarization event in a muscle fiber is gonna get that muscle fiber to contract. Now, we like to have really good control of our muscles. So one nerve impulse will result in one muscle contraction. If the acetylcholine sticks around here in the synaptic cleft, what we're going to have is one nerve impulse that's going to stimulate multiple nerve, I mean, stimulate multiple muscle contractions. That's not what we want. So what happens to the acetylcholine? So we got to get rid of it. There is an enzyme that is released most of that enzyme is released from the neuron 
comes into the synaptic cleft and gets rid of the, and, and erases it basically. It breaks it down. The name of that enzyme is called, it's right up here, number seven, acetylcholinesterase. I know it's a long name, but if you can remember acetylcholine, right, it's just esterase. Acetylcholinesterase. And it's going to break down all of that acetylcholine. Some of that acetylcholine, because it's a molecule within an open area, will, diffuse, will, will, will get lost. Okay? Most will get broken down by the enzyme. So the destruction of that acetylcholine prevents continued muscle contractions in the absence of stimulus. Because we want one, mus one nerve impulse to one muscle contraction. That's how we have good control. All right, so what we, sorry, what we've done is we have walked you through the process of the propagation of that action potential, how the excitation at the neuromuscular junction. Now we have an action potential spreading along the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber, which in turn is going to get that muscle to contract. Okay, we're not quite there yet, though. All right, so while we're here, we're going to talk about how does Botox work. All right, I know you've probably heard of Botox. Um, sometimes people will get Botox injected into their face. Okay, and we say that they have a reduction in wrinkles here. Okay, um... Now, what is Botox? Botox stands for botulism toxin. And it is a toxin. And it is a toxin produced by a bacterium known as Clostridium botulinum. I'm not going to ask you to remember that one. Not until you're in micro class. But Clostridium botulinum. And it produces this toxin. All right. And we're going to talk about what that toxin does, specifically. We, what we've done as humans is we have refined that toxin. We figured out how the toxin worked. We refined that toxin. And we figured out that we can inject it into very small muscles of the face, and it's going to prevent contractions. If you can prevent contractions, then you're going to prevent those small contractions of those muscles underneath the skin, your facial muscles, from contracting and therefore pulling on your skin and causing these wrinkles. All right. All right. So what happens if you are exposed to this clostridium botulinum? And it starts to produce this toxin inside your body. It's not just going to take away your wrinkles. Because what did I say it did? It prevented contractions. All right? So this toxin works at the neuromuscular junction. That's why we're talking about it. So it has its action at the neuromuscular junction. <clears throat> Take a look at this picture on the left. Okay, this is, it looks similar to what we just talked about. We have an impulse and a neuron. Look here, we have uh, vesicles of acetylcholine. So you now know, it's the calcium that rushed in. The calcium prompted the exocytosis of the vesicles. Now we're getting acetylcholine within the synaptic cleft. Yeah, we know that. So acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is being picked up by receptors here on the motor end plate of the sarcolemma. You already know that. And that's going to get that muscle ultimately to contract. Now, what if there was the botulism toxin here? The botulism toxin works here at the neuromuscular junction. And what it does is, even though an impulse is traveling down, and that impulse stimulates the calcium, stimulates the calcium, um, ion channels to open up and allow calcium to go in. Okay. The, the Botox, the toxin, prevents the vesicles of acetylcholine 
from undergoing exocytosis. So all those little vesicles stay within the axonal ending. They're, it doesn't release the acetylcholine. So everything's the same, right, except it doesn't release the acetylcholine. If there is no acetylcholine here within the synaptic cleft, there's no acetylcholine to be picked up by receptors. Therefore, nothing is going to stimulate that sarcolemma from depolarizing. If you don't have a depolarization event, you're not going to have action potential. If you don't have the action potential spreading along the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber, it's not going to result in a muscle contraction. So you could have nerve impulses being sent all day long down these motor neurons. This muscle is not going to contract. Now, this works for us if we are in, if we want to, you know, look surprised without wrinkles. Um, the muscles here, even though they're getting the impulses, they can't contract. And now you know why. Now, if we were infected with the organism that created this toxin, the infection itself of that organism, not too bad. However, it's the toxin that it produces. And if that toxin is traveling throughout your body within the circulatory system, it's going to have an effect on all of your muscles, okay, and even your diaphragm. So if impulses are being sent to your diaphragm along the phrenic nerve and it doesn't release the acetylcholine, guess what doesn't contract? Your diaphragm. Your diaphragm doesn't contract. If your diaphragm doesn't contract and the other muscles don't contract, then you can't breathe, right? So it is a deadly toxin. Okay. <clears throat> so that concludes this lecture, All right? This is the second in the muscle lecture. And then you're going to have another muscle, the, the next one, will be contraction coupling. So it'll be muscles, contraction coupling, and we're going to talk about, we're basically kind of picking up where we left off. We're going to see, all right, now that the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber is experiencing that action potential, what happens now? What else has to happen in order to get that muscle to contract? So that it will be your next lecture. It'll be muscles, contraction coupling, sliding filament. Thanks for listening.